Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Paul Amos, founder of The Redeemed. The Redeemed is a community of men who've come together to discuss life's difficulties as well as the triumphs over those difficulties. We're open to all men of all types, and today we have a very special story of redemption. Blake Russell is going to come with us today and to tell about his path and his overcoming story that is truly renowned. Blake, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, Paul. Thank you so much. I, you know, our audience has always asked that we get started with a few things that get to know you and to make you, uh, you know, somebody that they feel like they get to touch and talk to. So we'll go with a few easy ones if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. It's perfect. Favorite food? Oh, steak and shrimp. Steak and shrimp. I love it. Yeah. Um, book you're reading right now? Uh, the Bible and Emotional Intelligence. Emotional intelligence, I love that. EI is definitely something yes. that I learned about in graduate school and uh, really has helped temper my life and make me into to a different person. No, it's it's a book of wisdom, definitely. That's awesome. Um, favorite thing to do with your kids? Oh, man, just be in the yard. Just enjoy them, uh, watching them play. And we're, we're, we're people, we're home people, so just in the yard with them. If you're going to go on vacation, is it mountains or beach? Probably mountains. Mountains, okay. Mid December. Everybody has the different float. I like the water. Some people That's love the mountains. <laughs> I think that, and there are a few really lucky people that get go to Lake Tahoe and they get both. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, that's great. Well, let's start today with uh, a little bit of your history, if right. that's okay, mm -hmm. and let's dial it all the way back to how did you fall in love with baseball? Oh man, I played baseball as far back as I can remember. I think you know, four years old in t-ball. Um, Never really got into any other sport. I played other sports, but baseball always seemed to be the one where I just fell in love with early on. And your history as an incredible baseball star, mm. that's something that still brings, breathes through to you. Tell me about your passion for the game that still exists today. Yeah, well, I, I speak to a lot of athletes today. I share my story with a lot of you know um, high school students around the city, but Baseball was such a big part of, of my life, mm -hmm. um, such a good part of my life as far as the discipline and everything that went into it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've always been an avid baseball fan. Um, and so it's, it's, it's always been a center of my life. I feel like it will be it's in some shape, form, or fashion, you know, for the rest of my life, whether it's coaching my kids or speaking to high school students, you know, telling my story. So, yeah, I love baseball. One big highlight for us. Yeah. Not. I know you're such a humble guy, and you probably don't want to brag, but just take this one moment and tell us a highlight that you truly love. Oh, one of my baseball memories. Yeah, please. Oh, there's so many of them. Um, well, I was a I was a junior college. I went into junior college as a freshman. I led the nation in saves as a junior college freshman. That was a pretty big deal. Yeah, of course. Um, didn't like closing and being a saver. A uh, save kind of guy when I first went into college I was always a starter mm -hmm. but just being able to embrace that you know seventh eighth ninth inning come in and shut it down uh those memories were really fun uh, and then probably the next one would be my senior year of high school I threw back to back no hitters one wow. against one against Russell County and the next against Tallahassee I had 27 innings of uh scoreless pitching I didn't give up a earned run for 27 innings uh in that back-to-back -back, no hitter stretch that was a pretty big deal I don't think it's ever been done in this area you know so wow okay I'm blown away like yeah. I knew a few things but I didn't know that part of the story yeah that is outstanding I that's mean, the one newspaper clip I still have I think <laughs> I got you it, was, got it said you. Russell's no no that's really cool yeah that's really cool all right uh from the the fun topic mm -hmm. getting into some meteor topics right um you got introduced to marijuana at age 13 mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about what it's like to start interacting with, you know, uncontrolled substances and a little bit about what influence that had in your life and how yeah. things went from there. Yeah. 13. That was the, the first time I smoked marijuana. It was also the first, it was also the year that I drank alcohol for the first time. Yeah. Um, wasn't raised around it uh, by any means. Parents didn't drink, smoke, didn't cuss, didn't, you know, just didn't have it on my radar growing up, um, really normal upbringing. But when I was 13, there was a group of kids that we all played basketball in the neighborhood right outside of my house. Like it was my basketball goal that we all played on. And one day, one of the older kids uh, or one of the one of the kids that I played with, his older brother had a joint and we all ran behind the house. They were smoking. It was like nine of us. And I remember standing there 
all my friends, we kind of all circled around, not even really knowing what I was doing. Uh, and the older brother fired it up. And as the joint came around, I hit it and, uh, you know, passed it on and, and went on back to playing basketball 10 minutes later. And I remember, I remember feeling the, the high, but it wasn't like an overtaking kind of just where I couldn't function. Um, but I always say in that moment, what that did though, was that was such a pivotal moment in my life because it took away innocence from me. Like that moment introduced me to, uh, controlled substances and narcotics or drugs, if you will. And so anytime from that point on that I was around them until I got into full fledged addiction, if they were introduced or passed to me, the apprehension or the tension of, Oh my gosh, that's drugs. It was gone. But that's what that did to me in that moment. It took my innocence. And so that started a downward spiral that would last, you know, 16 years. Marijuana was, I don't know if they call it the gateway drug anymore, but it definitely was. I definitely still feel it is. I mean, I didn't wake up at 13 years old and say, today I'm going to be a cocaine addict, which I eventually became. No kid does. No, no man wakes up and says, today I'm doing heroin. You know, no, it's always like, today I'm going to drink a little beer. You know, I'm going to take some pills. I'm going to smoke a joint. The next thing you know, you know, you're deeper and deeper. Well, my mom has passed away uh, now 12 years ago, so I can say this on the radio. I started drinking at 13, too, mm -hmm. so I can understand uh, a little bit about what it was like to taste right. that. And I certainly had not encountered recreational drugs, uh, but that did open a door. Yes. And it certainly leads to a whole lot of difficult conversations mm -hmm. and difficult encounters in your life. You know, you mentioned from there going into full-fledged addiction. Right. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. And then obviously from there, there is a, a, a big shift in your life going to prison. Yeah. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your history and a little bit about how that progressed. Yeah. So at 13, like I said, it, the innocence was taken away. I was a baseball player, like we've mentioned. And so uh, actually my neighbor uh, was, a, was a senior at the high school and I was a freshman. So she always had uh, upperclassmen over at her house or they were going to parties and that's kind of how it started and the door opened to me. I was always hanging around upperclassmen. You know, I, I hung around kids my age some, but I, I jumped real quick into riding to football games with juniors and seniors. And obviously they're doing uh, drugs, they're, they're drinking alcohol. And, and so it just progressed. I remember those early years, 13, 14, 15 was uh, alcohol and marijuana. And then you're at a party or you're, you know, I remember, I think I was at a party somewhere and ecstasy was on the scene and, you know, once like I, it, it goes back to that gateway. Once you're introduced, uh, if if you have, you know, people call it an addictive personality, or I was always chasing the high. Like I, I liked the party scene. You know, I, I never thought in a million years it would take me into what it took me into. But so anytime ecstasy was offered, or mushrooms, or acid, or anything, um, I would always calculate and count the count the cost. If I can do this and then somehow sober up halfway before I get home, then let's do it. You know, if I can stay off on the weekends, like if I can somehow, I remember having moments where I knew I wanted to do ecstasy that night, being 15, 16 years old, calling my dad and my stepmom and saying, hey, can I spend the night at so-and-so's house? And if they said, yeah, that's fine, then I would do it, right? If they said, no, you need to come home tonight, then I wouldn't do it. You know, I, I was counting, I was already learning how to be manipulative and deceitful and lying. And, wow. and that comes with that territory because you're not, it's not on the table. And so naturally what happened with me is as I progressed in my addiction, also I progressed in my manipulation, my ability to hide things, Yeah, you know? So, and that led me that, that progressed all the way through high school, but it never affected like grades. You know, it never affected my manners. I was always a yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Kind of kid. I was raised right. Uh, I continued to excel on the baseball field. I got called up my, the end of my freshman year to be a varsity pitcher. So as I'm progressing in addiction and alcohol and just partying, nothing on the, on the surface that my parents or my coaches are looking at is out of the ordinary. Yeah. And that was a big thing. You know, some kids, they get caught early on and it just kind of comes to light. Mine stayed under the radar for a pretty good while. So, Some of my own struggles were very similar to yours in yeah. that they were hidden for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. In fact, a long period of time. Yeah. I'm curious, do you ever wish you'd gotten caught? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy you asked that. I'm 
I'm, uh, I'm in the process of trying to get a book off the ground about my testimony. And I was saying that yesterday as I was audio recording one of the chapters, um, man, I, it would have been the best thing that happened to me. I look back now and if, and, and I did get, I got a DUI when I was 16, but it was a slap on the wrist. My parents had to pay the money. You know, mm-hmm. No, no inconvenience to me other than getting up on Saturday mornings and having to go to a DUI class. That was an inconvenience, you know, a 16 year old having to get up early on a Saturday. But man, if I look back now, if I could have just, I would have just stayed in school and I would have played baseball. I would have been one of those kids that didn't, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't know, because I had multiple friends that didn't push the pedal like I did. They would get high, they would drink a few beers, and they would go home. And the next day, they're they're up being normal. Like I don't know what in me made me push the pedal more, you know. And so I look back now and I go, yeah, if I if I would have gotten caught or you know if I would have just just straightened up, you know, if I can go back and speak to the the fifteen year old Blake or. That's what I do when I speak to high school students now or FCA athletes or whatever. It's like, hey, you don't really know that the decisions you're making right now, even the music you're listening to is, is, is drastically affecting the decisions that you're making that's going to affect your life the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah. Somebody would have told me that, I would have been like, well, he's just full of it. But, man, if I could have had a moment with 15-year-old Blake and showed him, uh, things would have been a lot different. I'd probably played pro ball and, you know, never had to go to prison and – you know, never became a, a full fledged addict, but yeah, you live and you learn. Uh, but there's, there was a lot of regrets in the early years before I met the Lord. Uh, that was one of the things that kind of suppressed and fueled even in prison and, and just in the streets and selling drugs. It was my, it was my shame and my regret from what I'd let my life become that would make me just kind of throw my hands in the air and say the heck with it all. You know, this is, this is what I'm going to be, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there was a lot of regrets until I met the Lord, you know, so. You mentioned going to prison. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a consequence that very few of us have had to experience, mm-hmm. and yet you got the the full brunt of what happened. Right. Tell us a little bit about going to prison and a little bit about joining a gang in prison and yeah. what impact that had on your life and what appealed to you yeah. about that life. Well, as I started kind of deteriorating, um, I got kicked out of college. It all started kind of right here. I, I was at CAC. I was at Central Alabama Community College. They were a really big powerhouse JUCO. I went JUCO uh, out of high school. I didn't have any D1 offers, but CAC was number three in the nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had just went to the Junior College World Series. Uh, my freshman year, we went 49-9. and nine. I mean, I led the nation in saves, and we were just a powerhouse. Uh, I remember being at practice and Jim Wells, the Alabama baseball coach was there to watch me. Uh, I was getting looked at by Alabama and Ole Miss, Oregon. Um, there were some pro scouts that were starting to come on the scene. Well, it had gotten noted to the coach that I had been selling weed to the rest of the team, which was kind of true, kind of not 22 kids on the, on the team, 18 of us smoke weed. Um, the weed where we were was not good product. And so I would come through Auburn going to my wife or my girlfriend at the time's uh, dorm and I would meet a buddy and get weed and take it to the college I was at and just kind of dish it out. We'd all smoke weed. Well, it got back to the coach. He uh, released me from the team on a Monday morning. Wouldn't give me the option of uh, taking a urinalysis. Wouldn't kind of give me an option to plead my case. Just release papers signed by him, the assistant coach, and the president of the college. Well, I got on the phone, the phone with Coach Thomas, that was the CVCC coach at the time, and told him what was going on. And he recruited me out of high school. He said, well, if you can pass a drug test for me, I'll give you a scholarship. If you can be down here Tuesday, you pass a drug test, I'll give you a scholarship on Thursday. Wow. So I got kicked out of one college for essentially selling weed to the team, leading the nation in saves, having D1 coaches there all the time at practice to watch me throw bullpens. Came home to Chattahoochee Valley, no harm, no foul. You know, swept up under the rug. But what did happen in that moment is my relationship with my father just deteriorated from the time I got kicked out. So instead of being a humble 18, 19 year old kid that went home to dad's house, kind of just took a, a while to for some discipline to set in, I just kind of threw my hands up and and essentially just went into the streets. I stayed with my mother, but she didn't have any kind of discipline for me. You know, I was a 19 year old kid. And uh, so I was at Chattahoochee Valley. Uh, I was there and I remember it was on a Sunday and I was pitching in a tournament in Gaston, Alabama. And uh, in the last inning of the game, I was still pitching. I had like 10, 12 strikeouts that game. I sat in the dugout with two Brave Scouts in the last inning of the game. And they were telling me, hey, this time next year, we want to sign you to rookie ball. You got a chance to be making some money next year. 
go to school, keep your nose clean, stay out of trouble. We're going to sign you. I walk out of the dugout. There's an Anaheim Angel scout there when they were in Anaheim, and there was a Kansas City Royal scout, and um, they were shaking my hand, getting my information. That was on a Sunday. I was that close. Tuesday, I was arrested for the first time for marijuana possession with the intent to distribute. Kicked out of CVCC on a Wednesday because a student athlete can't catch a felony. They have to lose their scholarship. I remember Coach Thomas asking me to come live with him. He said, wow. come live with me. What coach asked a player? I mean, he had just gotten – he was newly married, just had a son. He said, Blake, come live with me. In eight months, you're out of here. You're out of here. I'm going to let you come and practice with the team, work out with the team. I'll give you your scholarship back in the spring, but I got to take it. And next fall, you're drafted, man. You're out of here. Eight months. And I remember telling him, no, coach, I'm going to take about six months to kind of, you know, rest and relax. And what I was telling myself is essentially baseball will always be there. I got six months to use the excuse of I need some time, but I can really just party now and do what I want to do. Well, that started the legal kind of issues in my life. I was put on probation for that charge, never reported to a probation officer. I, was, I could never pass a drug test. I did a month in the county jail, um, got out, didn't report, eventually did two more months, got out, didn't report, and eventually about five or six months later they caught me, and I stood in front of the judge, and he sentenced me to the remainder of my probation, which was a three-year probation sentence. He, he sentenced me to the remainder of it, which was 15 months at the time, to Alabama Department of Corrections hard labor. At this time, I'd been out of baseball in college for about eight months. And so that, that ship is slowly sailing away from the dock more and more and more. But as a 19-year-old kid, I tell everybody, I, I was 19 years old, but with a Hollywood-sized ego. And, and no character. All my life, I've been patted on my back about how good of a baseball player. I remember I would get in fights at school, go to the principal's office. I remember one time, and they said, well, if you win this game, you're not suspended. Really? You lose in school suspension for a week. Well, I would win the game. And, it's, and so when, you're, when a kid is 19, and you see it all the time. I, I mean, I was in prison with some of these athletes, these five stars that go to Alabama. They get caught with a pistol, and you don't ever hear anything about them again. I was in prison with them. They're, they're Hollywood-sized egos with world talent, but their character level is so low, and, it's, and that's, what it, that's what I had. And so went to prison for the first time when I was 22 and did 15 months. And um, that was, you know, I was an athlete by trade, by nature. I'm an athlete, so I'm going to gravitate wherever there's a ball, wherever there's sports, and that opens the door. For a lot of us as, as athletes, it, it lets us cross cultural, uh, race, ethnic bounds that a lot of guys can't cross. Mm -hmm. I was the only, I played basketball with all the black guys. I played softball with all the black and white guys. I played soccer with all the Hispanic guys. And so I was navigating throughout the prison, just resourcing all day, every day. So when I came home after doing 15 months, I, it was pretty, that first prison run was kind of a cakewalk. It was a big vacation. So and, I mean, there would be another prison time that would come that wouldn't be a vacation. But, yeah, that was, that was my first run. Um, and I came home after doing 15 months and went back to my dad's for like a year. He's a general uh, – he works for a big contracting company here. And I remember I was doing construction work and thinking, man, I got buddies that are out here making $1,000 before lunchtime selling drugs. And I'm, I'm busting my, my chops all week, toting boards. I'm making 350 bucks, you mm -hmm. know, and – do I want to be a carpenter? Do I want to be a superintendent? Do I want to be a contractor? And that lucrative, fast money was sitting there being made. And so I remember I counted the cost after about a year of being out, and I thought, well, I'm just going to go sell drugs again. I'm going to leave my dad's house. If I get caught selling drugs again, the worst the state can do to me is send me back to prison. They had already pulled their trump card. That's the worst thing they can do. And, and I, I counted the cost, and I thought, well, if I go back to prison, that was a cakewalk. I'll go do a few years, and I'll come out. So I'm already – counting the costs. And, a, and I look back now, you asked a question a minute ago about, do I have, you know, what would I have said? I, I was a perfect candidate. They don't do it anymore. But if I'd have stood in front of that judge and he just said, I tell you what, Blake, you're going to do three years in prison or like three years in the army, three years in the Marine <laughs> Corps. I'd have been like, sign me up. And I could have took a, a totally different trajectory of life, but I went to prison and, and I'm a people person. And so I excelled in the prison and I ended up getting caught after that year of being out, um, I caught a trafficking methamphetamine case, uh, got caught with a whole bunch of uh, crystal meth and ice, 
and I got a uh, I got sentenced to 15 years on this one. This was my second, and th- this time I'm I'm 25 years old. I'm a full fledged cocaine addict. I'm a full fledged crystal meth addict. Um, baseball was long gone. Uh, the relationship that I have with Krista, who's my wife now, she left me on that first prison tour that I did after being with her for four years. And the life that I had grown up in, the life that I had knew, was a long, distant memory before I stepped into prison in 2008 wow. the second time. Mm-hmm. So you come out of prison. Mm-hmm. You spend a year contemplating what to do. Right. You decide to go back to this, and then you get the big charge. Yes. Where are you emotionally? Where are you spiritually? Where are you as a human being at that point beyond being a full-fledged addict? Yeah. No, oh, spiritually I'm dead. I don't know anything about Jesus mm. at this point. Um, I had you know great parents growing up, good morals, but no church, no community, no no gospel. Definitely no Jesus. To me, Jesus was a fairy tale figure that was right up there. Uh, he was the reason for the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. I knew that somehow. Spiritually, I'm dead. Emotionally, I am uh, ashamed. I'm hanging out with people. I'm doing stuff that. None of my childhood friends or even my, my, my college friends, or they don't even know these people. I mean, I'm in a dark underworld. Um, and so just full of shame, full of regret, but also full of anger. And somehow there was a drive in me to, I knew what I was doing. I knew I was going to go to prison. I knew this was going to be a cycle. But somehow the anger was distorted into fuel and the shame was distorted into, you know what, I'm I'm not going to let shame creep up every day. I'm not going to live in depression. I'm just going to excel in selling drugs and running around with women and clubbing and partying. And But it was, I look back on those years now, Paul, and it was, it was such a foggy time in my life. Um, but emotionally, I was, I was depressed and angry. Um, and spiritually, I was, I was dead. Mm-hmm. So having never been to prison myself, mm-hmm. I know that from what I hear and understand from the people that I've talked to, drugs are available inside. Oh, yeah. I saw more drugs at at one time on a prison cot than I ever saw on the streets. And so did you find yourself on a path to healing, or did you find yourself on a path to continuation of your your habit Mm -hmm. as you got into prison the second time? Yeah, the second time down, I was 25. I I knew I had 15 years. I knew I had at least three years to do before I was eligible for parole. Mm -hmm. So I had three years of where the state wasn't even going to look at me. And I really, before I went to prison that second time, I sold drugs, but I was more of a a recreational user who had drugs. Mm -hmm. I used drugs then for like the party scene, sell drugs to make money, but it was always just a, it was a, it was a lifestyle. It wasn't to make money. When I went to prison that second time, uh, I actually became more of a drug dealer than I did. I was a user. I was still addicted, but I became more of a drug dealer. Um, And it was fairly easy to get the drugs into the prison. Um, There's only one way drugs are coming into a prison, and that's on a human body. You know, uh, we're not getting it dropped in with drones and out of helicopters. And and so we found, I, I, I teamed up with a few buddies of mine that were from around the state, but they were guys that were in my dorm. And we found a certain way of uh, getting them into the prison. And I made a few phone calls. Cell phones are illegal in prison, but they're in there. Um, They're, you know, we would, we would score cell phones, 40, 50 cell phones at a time. Uh, And so I would get on my cell phone and I would make a few phone calls here in Columbus, uh, get a few friends to throw in a batch of drugs for me. And we would pay somebody to uh, drive them up to Montgomery. They would transfer them to the, the, the guard and then the guard would bring them in. And so he would get paid. But I became more of a drug dealer in prison that second round. Uh, And so I also, that's the time my second, in 2010, I had been been in prison for roughly a year. I became a gang member at that point too. Didn't grow up around gangs. I grew up on the north side of Columbus. I mean, uh, Columbus and Phoenix City. I lived right off Bradley Park and then I lived off Somerville Road. Gangs were not on my radar growing up, uh, but I became a gang member through the drug trade that I was involved in. And so, yeah, and those were... Those first three years on that second prison run were the years that that's, you know, that was the time where 
that was the epitome of it. I had hit rock bottom. That 2008 to 2012 were the worst years of my life. I was a gang member. I had become an intravenous drug user. Um, I was a drug dealer. I was I was I was dealing cell phones. I was in and out of lockup cells. Uh, I had been on restriction for two or three years uh, in prison, getting caught with cell phones, getting in fights, insinuating riots. Uh, I caught 24 major disciplinaries in a 19 month span. Um, yeah, so it was it was pretty tough. And in 2012, um, I got C51. It's called a, a C51 lateral transfer. It's when you essentially get kicked out of a prison. You're such a problem inmate. They they put you in lockup so many times that they'll laterally transfer you with another inmate across the state somewhere, and they're just switching up your atmosphere. They're just giving you a fresh start in another prison. Interesting. So that happened to me April 22nd of 2012, and that's kind of when I look back now and you talk about seeing the hand of God move in your life. I didn't know it at the time, but now I look back after I got saved and gave my life to, to Jesus, I look back now and I can see the hand of God start to move on that day, April 22nd of 2012. I got transferred from Montgomery, uh, Elmore County, uh, Alabama, and I got transferred down to Clow, Alabama, which is right outside of Eufaula. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah. You are so poised and so comfortable telling your story, mm. and yet what you went through sounds pretty horrific. Yeah. How did, you know, God has to be at the center of this transformation. Mm. I mean, this whole ministry is called the redeemed because we believe that God takes us, buys us back and gives us a second chance. So you get moved from one prison to another. This is a second chance. Yeah. Is this when God enters? I mean, you said this is when you could feel the touch of him, but yeah. how does he, how does he make himself yeah. come into you? So April 22nd, I got transferred. I got woke up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, by a lieutenant that always said he would be there when they transferred me, and he was there. He was one of the first faces I saw. I was a intravenous drug user at the time. I was putting a needle in my arm two or three times a day, doing cocaine and and, and crystal meth. I was 171 pounds. I'm six four now, about two ten. Imagine me at six four, one seventy one, very small. Um, and they transferred me, and I got to Easterling Correctional Facility, and it was the first time in my life, Paul, for 16 years. Where when I got to this prison, I started to get sober. Since wow. the time I was 13, I'd always done drugs in the county jail. I'd always done drugs in prison. For 16 years, I was high on something. Very rarely did a week or two go by where I didn't have some kind of toxins from drugs in me. I got to this prison. I went immediately into a, a, a restricted dorm, which is a lockup dorm, for one month. Well, in that month, I got sober, Right. And I got out, and there were some guys that I had been locked up with at the other prison that had got transferred there as well. And they were like, hey, we got a route, which means we got a way. We got a, we got a way into the prison. We got a route. If you want to put something together, let's do it. You know, they already saw me. They knew who I was. They knew what I was about. They said essentially, hey, we got a guard that will bring it if you can get the package somewhere. And we can set this prison off the same way we did the last one. Something in me, though, I, I was clean. I was sober. I, my mind was, you know, I, I wasn't high. And I just said, no, give me, give me a few weeks. Let me see the layout of the land. Let me look at the prison and, uh, and I'll get back with y'all. And, but something in me, I just, I just didn't do it. I did not score a package of dope. And, um, they had drugs in the prison, but it wasn't my type of drugs. It was suboxins and methadones and heroin. And I was never an opiate based guy. I was always a speed guy. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't do it. And for six months I got on the weight pile. Um, I immersed myself into kind of normal prison life, you know, got a prison institutional job, um, got on the weight pile, started reading a lot of books. Um, I was reading books left and right, um, just sober, you know, entertaining my mind. I started watching sports again, and uh, it was late October of 2012, a guy that I used to play basketball with on the yard, Jeremy Boone. He's from Valley, Alabama. He, he invited me to a prison chapel service. And I was like, okay, I'll go. It was like if me and you were good friends, and you're like, hey, man, come come with me. I would go with you just out of respect because you're my buddy. I'm sure. going to go with you and support yeah. you. <clears throat> so I went with him that night to the chapel, sat there and listened to the uh, the preacher, and nothing really turned. You know, I was like, okay, it's a good service. But on the way back to the dorms, he was very zealous for the Lord, and he was like, uh, man, you coming back tomorrow? And I was like, I don't know, man. I'll, I'll let you know. And 
But what did happen that night is I was in between books. It's very interesting. I was in between a Sammy the Bull Gravano, which was John Gotti's hitman, Mm -hmm. and I was waiting on the John Gotti autobiography to get there. So I'm in between Sammy the Bull and John Gotti. And these were the kind of books I like to read. They were mafia hitmen. They were underworld, stuff I was into. And that book had not came yet. It didn't come in mail call that night. And so I went to my box, and the only book that I had outside of this big Bible that a preacher gave me in the county jail four months prior was Joyce Meyer's Battlefield of the Mind that my mom had sent in to me four years ago. I don't know how this book made it through all my mess in prison, but it was there. And I just picked up Joyce Meyer's Battlefield of the Mind and started reading it, and um, something took off in me. Um, I started uh, copying scripture out of her book. I would copy this page, these pages from this book like word for word. I had a notebook. I would just copy Joyce Meyer's words. And as I'm doing that, though, I'm getting the word of God in me. And and Jesus said, no one comes to the Father unless he draws them. And this was my drawing. I didn't know it at the time. Two weeks later, I went into the chapel by myself. It was hot. It was, you know, late October, early November. And um, they were showing the passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I went in and I sat down far right pew. They dimmed the lights. And uh, I'm watching this movie. And my moment of salvation came about halfway through this movie. Um, I'm having this sentimental moment with this actor on screen, Jesus. It's almost like if I watch The Notebook now with my wife, I may cry. You know, it's just a sentimental movie, and I'm a, I'm a crier. I'm a guy, but I'll cry at a movie, no, no harm, no foul. And uh, I'm watching this movie, and I'm crying for this guy, this Jesus, actor. And uh, just something in me, I started saying a prayer to God. I, I, I just After watching this movie, I put my hands, you know, in my, my head in my hands, and I'm crying a little bit, and I said, God, if you're real, you know, I need you to help help me, you know. Um, you're going to have to show yourself to me, though. You know, I don't, you're going to have to show me you're real. If you're real, if you can even hear me, um, I'm asking you to to help me. And I remember I told the Lord, you know, uh, if you if you change my life, I'll follow you. And I, I remember I gave the Lord like one month. I said, God, if you're real, you'll show yourself in one month at least. And uh, And I was crying and but from that day forward, uh, just a hunger in me for the Word and a quickening for the things of God. And that was my moment of salvation. I didn't know it, but that was the day I said a little prayer, not knowing if God even heard me. And something changed on the inside of me. That is powerful. Mm-hmm. And to step in there, that movie, The Passion of Christ, very I remember going to see it at the movie theater and the most amazing part of it all beyond the movie was the complete silence that the crowd walked out of yeah. the movie theater in. You could have heard a pin drop. Mm. And I'd never seen anything like that in my whole life because people, I think, were so moved, even people who were not mm. Christians like yeah. yourself. Yeah. Uh, and um, and so you, you see this movie. You are so impacted by it. You give God a month. Mm-hmm. How did he show up? Wow. So the first thing that happened that I noticed is I got such a hunger for the Bible. Uh, I had tried to read the Bible in numerous occasions in prison, on numerous occasions, where when you're in a lockup cell, all they give you is like a Bible. If you're a Muslim, they give you Quran. If you're a Buddhist, they'll give you your Buddhist kind of uh, booklets. But I would try to read the Bible, and it never made sense. I never had any understanding. Uh but after that day, I got such a hunger for the Word and the Bible. I had this little pocket Bible. It wasn't a Gideon's Bible, but it was a little pocket Bible. And from that day forward, even if I was on the yard, if I was in the dorm, I was reading this Bible. And, um, and I got a hunger for the Word. And then, and, then, and then conviction came pretty quick, too. Like, I was always a cusser. Like, I cuss, like, I cuss just, I use cuss words as, like, verbs. You know, I would describe something and be like, MF and whatever. And... I couldn't cuss anymore. That was a, I actually thought I was going bipolar. I thought something mentally. I called my mom and I said, you need to call the doctors and get the, get me to the infirmary. She's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, mom, I, I don't know. I've been reading the Bible. I've been thinking a lot about Jesus. Uh, I, I can't cuss mom. I can't watch TV. I think something mental is happening to me. I'm just not really interested in much right now. And of course she was like, oh my gosh, I think you're hearing from God. And I was like, I don't know, maybe, you know. And so conviction came, uh, humility came. That was one of the big things. I remember um, I remember going around the prison and apologizing to guys that I'd gotten a fight with, uh, other gang members. I remember I walked up to a – I'd gotten a fight with a guy on the volleyball court about two weeks prior to this where I slapped him and then you know whooped him up pretty bad. And he was a crip. He was a crip gang member, and there was always almost a really big 
deal from this fight. And um, I remember I walked over to his dorm, and they were all standing outside, and I apologized. I told him his name was Riri, and I told him I wanted to apologize for our fight a couple weeks before. These are all Crip gang members, and they're looking at me like, this has got to be some type of ambush, or this <laughs> this guy is off his rocker, mm-hmm. you know. And so humility came. Uh, I started being nicer to the guards. I started, you know, not trying to defy authority. You know, when they would say prison yard closed, every inmate tries to get his last little bit of networking in before he goes back to his dorm. I would just walk to the dorm. Um, I started spending a lot of time in the chapel, and that's where I kind of my roots went in with the with. Um, just discipleship. I got around some guys that are all still locked up, um, and they taught me how to pray. They taught me how to read the Bible. They taught me how to study the Bible. And so I immersed myself in that type of lifestyle for about 13 months, and then I would get out. With the gang, I was a a Latin king. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm a white guy, but I was accepted into the Latin kings. You can only go so high in rank if you're not of Hispanic descent. But my ability to traffic drugs got me in, and I found a brotherhood in that. They saw such an authentic change that they put me as what's called a non-active status. Gangs inside the prisons have a very structured hierarchy. There's a very structured organization. I mean, in the prisons, it is organized crime. Out here, it kind of loses its footing because there's different. But they saw such an authentic change that they came to me. They called a big meeting and said, if you feel like you're being called by God to follow, follow God and become a man of God, then we're not going to stand in your way for that. And uh, they actually, some of them started coming to the chapel with me. I remember one of them specifically got saved, and then he died six months later of cirrhosis of the liver. Um, And so for 13 months, I just immersed myself, essentially what was ministry school. Mm. I had all the time in the world. You know, I had nothing but time. And so that was was the turning point. It was 2012. Uh, I wasn't looking for God, um, but he came. He saw me, and he came. So interwoven into this amazing story mm-hmm. is Krista, your girlfriend, now wife, right. now mother of your children. Right. So you told me that you break up in the parking lot she of, was, yeah. of the jail. She was Miss Phoenix City. Miss Phoenix City. And she was having to come and visit me after hours because publicists, they didn't, you couldn't have Miss Phoenix City come in to visit her boyfriend during normal visitation hours. So they would let her come after hours. Wow. And they would walk me out. And uh, I got a little bit of trustee status in 05. And uh, she came out there and said, I just, our lives are going in two totally different directions. And she broke up with me. And I remember being so prideful and just asking her like, okay, then, you know, get on out of here then. Bye. After four years, I was that numb because of dope. And so, yeah, we broke up and 13 years went by. I, uh, obviously, I, I have a cell phone in prison, so I'm on Facebook in 2009 when it launches. She was on the CBS show Survivor, so she's on the TV in the day room in prison. All my buddies are heckling me because they knew that I was my, come wow. watch your girl, and I would walk out and see Krista on CBS on Survivor over in Nicaragua and just go back to the dorm and smoke a blunt or do a shot just to forget. I'm watching on Facebook. I'm watching her get married. Uh you know, I'm, I'm watching all my buddies. I'm watching my friends, you know, buy houses, get mortgages, graduate college, start families. And that was some of the, I'm watching everybody that I grew up with essentially do what a normal person does in life. And here I am sitting in prison. So that was some of the fuel mm-hmm. that like, you know what, who cares, whatever, you know? And so, yeah, I get out of prison and I remember I'm, I'm backstage at a church and I'm about to go on stage to open the church up in prayer. And I get a message from her on Facebook and she's married at the time. And she said, I'm so proud of you. I can't even put in words. I thought honestly, the next time that I, I even spoke your name would be at your funeral, you know? And wow. so, yeah, 13 years goes by and, um, she goes through a divorce in 2016, which is also the same year that we just miraculously ran into each other in Atlanta on the sidewalk of all places. And yeah, kind of the rest is history. But that's even part of the redemption. You know, I went back to college and played baseball when I got out of prison the second time after 30 years. I mean, I was 30 years old. And Coach Thomas, I, I was mentoring a young kid, and the kid was telling Coach Thomas, I think Blake still got it. He's in the 90s, at least. And so I went down there and threw a bullpen for Coach Thomas just for old time's sake and was 90-91 as a you know, 30-year-old recovered drug addict. And so I played baseball again for one semester in the fall. Um, 
God gave me that back. Uh, he redeemed my life with my wife now, who was I thought was always the one. Mm. You know, I never truly let her go in my heart. You know, and so yeah, he's he's the rock we stand on. That is an awesome story, mm. and you know, it it begs the question of okay, you keep talking about the word redemption, mm -hmm. and it's the heart and cornerstone of what we do here. But you know, what does redemption mean to you? Yeah. Fully bought back, fully redeemed, fully restored. You take one thing and you think, for us, it's our life. He redeems our life. He redeems us back to God. And you take something that's so broken, it's so out of its natural state, and in a moment, Christ redeems it back to its original intent, which with us, in the garden, we were supposed to walk with God, made in the same image of God. And what Christ does and what he done in my life is he redeemed. He gave back everything that I had squandered. You know, no questions asked. I didn't have to buy anything back. I didn't have to pay for anything. All I had to do was yield my life to him. And stage by stage, step by step, he has redeemed back everything that was originally mine. You know, and it's all out of love. We don't, I didn't do anything. I was sitting in prison sticking a needle in my arm. I was, I was a gang member. I was... I've, I've caused so many people so much harm. There's no way, if you look at what I've done on the side of the, if there's a scoreboard, all the stuff I've done, there's nothing that could redeem all that. That's the power of the cross. That's the power of the gospel. Yeah, we certainly don't deserve it. No, I, no, I deserve death. Yeah. If I got back anything and everything that I've ever done to anybody, the, 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 the evidence is substantial in a court of law. You know, when, for those people out there, some of whom are listening to this podcast, many of whom follow some of the stories that you and I follow. Mm -hmm. But that person who's led the perfect life, mm -hmm. that person who's done all the right things the right way, mm -hmm. that may or may not have dealt with some difficulties, but assuming those difficulties do come, I think in many ways they struggle to understand what God can do for them and yeah. what God can mean in their life. Right. Whereas when you've been in a place of complete rock bottom, mm -hmm. when you've been at a place where you've lost things in your life that matter I think understanding who God is and what he buys back for us is yeah. a much easier thing to accept mm -hmm. because you don't feel like you deserve to accept anything right. in response. Right. With the person who's, and we, me and my wife talk about this a lot, it's, it's, we call it kind of letting the rich or the normal person really understand the finer things in life. Jesus said in Revelation, I, I counsel you to come buy from me, you know, things that you can't buy with money and silver, gold, you know. Uh, milk and honey, things things of the spirit, things. And so with a person, and we have many people, many friends in our life that are very successful, and, and some of them are believers, some of them are not. And what I've noticed, the common theme is they have a peace, you know, but I have to trust that somewhere in their mind there is a what is the purpose of life. Mm -hmm. I've done all this, everything is great, but there has to be, I don't want to say a whole, but they have to contemplate what is the missing link. Yeah. And he's it. He's the missing link for the person who has it all together. And and you know, Isaiah twenty six three, Isaiah said he's able to keep in perfect peace he whose mind is stayed on him. Every person needs peace. Every person needs a savior. And whether you're doing great or you're on rock bottom, you know. So we've talked a lot about the history mm -hmm. and what got you to God's place, but you are clearly a different man today mm -hmm. than the man that was doing the things that you were doing from drug dealing and drug taking and acting. Talk a little bit about what you're doing today right. and about how you are preaching just like here, the word of God to inspire other people and maybe even what role sports has played in that for you. Yeah. Well, so I, I tend to kind of follow the Lord in the areas of my life that I see the most fruit. Um, and that's always around kids and the youth. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they relate to me. The minute I start talking about baseball or I start talking about kind of like the street side, um, I see a lot of fruit with uh, student athletes when I go and speak to high school baseball teams or high school basketball teams or just high schools in general. Um, but they have an ability to be able to kind of um, relate to me. A lot of these athletes and a lot of these kids that I talk to, <clears throat> they're star athletes. They got everything going, and they, they don't understand that in the blink of an eye, it can be taken. And I remember just specifically the other day I was with a kid, and and he's going to Auburn. He's a pitcher. He's just a big hoss. I mean, he's got a great career ahead of him. And I said, uh, I said, what are you going to do when you're not playing baseball anymore? 
But when this don't work out, I said, you do understand that, you know, one out of every 20,000 college kids go pro, right? Are you the one? And when I said that to him, I could see his lights, the lights went on and hit him. Like for the first time in his life, he was, he was faced with the, with the reality that baseball may not be it. Wow. And I said, well, who are you then? Because if you're not a, when you're not a baseball, and son, you may win five Cy Youngs. You may be the greatest player to ever play. But if you're not, who are you? And that was the issue for me. And so when I, I can just relate to the athletes, um, the jail and prison ministry. I was in the jail yesterday, and you know, I think 17 guys gave their life to the Lord. Uh, I have kind of the best bait with my testimony with them. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I just uh, preaching the gospel and and standing on a, a salvation and a, and a testimony of faith is very easy for me because I, I remember I remember the Blake before 2012. Like I can see him now. And just like you said, it's a miracle now, even even yourself, Paul, that we're we're walking in the light and the wisdom of God. That in itself is the greatest miracle. That we were once dead in our trespasses and now we're awake in Jesus. So pretty easy to preach and, and share Jesus um and faith. And and we when we do it and we follow the Lord in that authentic place, it bears fruit. You know, it bears fruit. That is just awesome that not only are you going out and preaching to the youth, but that you go back to a place that, let's be honest, yeah. when most people walk out of prison, they don't want to go back. Yeah. And for you to go back and care for and love and preach into those people, that means a lot. Mm. I mean, I go to Church of the Highlands here in town, uh, and church, yeah. it is a wonderful church, but I'm always moved by every single week how our pastor mm -hmm. stands on stage and welcomes not only the 24 campuses, but every place in the Alabama correctional wow. facilities yeah. that they have the they possibility have a big to reach. In Alabama, like if, when you're in the Alabama prison system, like Church of the Highlands, you know them. Like mm -hmm. They're known because of their consistency to go in. So you're right. Wow. Well, you've transformed, and that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're immune from difficulties. Mm-hmm. So you have been willing to talk about the fact that your wife has gone through a health issue. Right. And so, you know, for some of our listeners out there who think that you just get to go through life and it's perfect after mm -hmm. you're redeemed, it's not necessarily no. that way. No. God transforms our hearts, but he doesn't always transform our circumstances. Right. And so talk a little bit about what's going on and what, you know, what it's meant to you mm -hmm. that this is happening in your life. Yeah, well— you have to abide because Jesus didn't promise, like you said, he didn't promise that it would be perfect and it would be walking in the clouds. My wife has a stage two uh, breast cancer. She has it in her breast and in her lymph nodes. Uh, she just did round five of chemo last mm -hmm. Friday. So we're in the thick of it. But I don't know how people go through. I do know because I, I, I was once that person. But, man, it's, it's such a blessing to go through life now with Jesus, the yeah. hard and the easy. Matter of fact, the praise stands up even more in the hard times. And um, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't make it without him. I would have. I don't know how anybody does. Mm -hmm. You know, just in life circumstances, when trauma hits your house, like he has to be the rock. Psalm ninety-one. You know, uh, those who dwell up under the, the the wings of the Almighty. You know, we Jesus said in John fifteen, "Abide in me." You know, we have to abide because life. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-four, "It's going to get worse." You know, lawlessness is going to abound. The love of many is going to grow cold. As we watch the world's trajectory get colder and colder and darker and darker, he said that. But he invites us in to stay close to him, and that's how we get through. And so even with my wife's cancer, I mean, there's days where, if I can just be honest, it sucks. You know, like it's like to even today to leave and see her just kind of all she can do is lay in the bed. Um, but even to know that, you know, worst case scenario, we have a, a home that we're going to that's so far greater than any suffering. Paul said that the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that we will behold. So that anchor, those anchors of scripture, that anchor of faith lets us kind of just navigate through life. And the good days are great and we celebrate those, but the bad days we, we get quiet and we stay close to him, you know, like, so even like our children, if my son is scared, he's going to be right on my leg. Mm. If he's unsure, he's right there. And and we have to be like that with the Lord. I mean, it's not always going to be easy, but he, you know, he told us if we abide in Him, we'll be okay. Well, to our audience, I hope that you will keep Blake and his family in your prayers. I think going through Krista going through stage two breast cancer is 
an incredibly difficult trial, but I hope and will pray for her complete healing. Yes, sir. And that with two kids, a boy and a girl, mm -hmm. uh, that they get their mom for the remainder of their yeah, lives. Amen. And so I know how critically important a mama can be and a daddy too. Like it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show today and to listen to your story. I find myself sitting here more a more of a listener than a participant yeah, I today. To, to, no, no, I, no, no. Ran more, yeah. Your story is just so impactful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just appreciative that you would come here and share it with our audience. Yeah, well, Thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor. I've listened to the podcast. I've shared the podcast with some of my friends. Uh, I love what you guys are doing. I feel like it's right in just the vein of the heart of God. Uh, men are on God's heart, you know, uh, the, the, the spiritual order of a family, you know, the way God designed it. And so I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. That's awesome. To our audience, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen. Uh, and I would encourage you to go to our website, theredeem.com, and join our newsletter. It's the easiest way to get circled into all the activities that we're doing from small groups and the now venturing into a larger group, from podcasts to devotionals to any group meetings that we're having. Uh, just please get involved and engaged, even if it's as simple as, as checking out an email once a week. Blake, thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Good luck. Godspeed. Amen.